race to win wars and explore the stars, have created some of the most fantastic products ever designed, and we use them every day, unaware of their amazing origins. On Wicked Inventions. Biscuits, the sweet treat with a military pedigree. Sunscreen, protecting us from the sun since World War II. Hammocks, the perfect way to relax in your garden or on board a man of war. We reveal the amazing science and manufacture behind these wicked inventions. We know them as a tasty sweet treat to dunk into your cup of tea. But did you know the origins of the biscuit we enjoy today actually have a military connection? The word biscuit is derived from the Latin words bis, meaning twice, and coctus, meaning cooked or baked. And this refers to the age-old practice of making a hard-baked, flour-based food by a combination of baking and drying which has been known in Europe since medieval times and probably originated from the Persian Empire. This process created a dry foodstuff that had far greater shelf life than bread and could possibly solve a critical problem for campaigning armies. The old military adage always goes that an army marches on its stomach and supplying armies back in the kind of 16th, 17th, 18th century was just as important as actually winning battles. Armies would engage in months and months of manoeuvring where no fighting would take place, but men would be just dragged across Europe. And obviously supplying these men was such an important part of a military campaign. I mean, for example, in the Seven Years' War, half of the British sailors who died in that war died from malnutrition. So obviously this is something people tried to rectify. The answer to this military need was the introduction of biscuits to a soldier rations. Every major military power seemed to possess their own version of the biscuit, from the Roman Beculum through to a medieval version called Biscuit of Muslim, taken on the Crusades by King Richard I in 1189. But the European exploration of the globe and the rise of the military power of naval warfare and their need for long-lasting non-perishable food led to the creation of one of the most infamous biscuits ever created, the hardtack biscuit. The hardtack biscuits, the ship's biscuits, the soldier biscuits you get, they're like cobblestones, they're big, thick, they're full of wheat, they're full of corn protein, carbohydrates, fibre. When you bake them more and more and more, their shelf life increases, so something like a four-time baked biscuit has like a three-year lifespan. These would be then used to kind of pad out really dull, boring meals. So you might have used a hardtack biscuit to dip into a brine to make it a salty flavour. They would have dipped it into rum. They would have dipped it into stews. They'd have cooked it with meat. It could have been crumbled or broken down. It was just a constant source of energy. It's just a non-perishable food, which is good in most environments. The need for hardtack biscuits was eventually replaced by the introduction of tin foods in the late 19th century, and our idea of a biscuit today is far removed from the bland, long-lasting food injured by sailors and soldiers of history. A perfect example of this tasty modern biscuit are Kelson's butter cookies, baked in their Danish factory. Kelson uh, is the world's biggest marketeer of original Danish butter cookies. A very old niche product that actually can be dated more than 200 years back in time. The secret behind the Danish butter cookies is uh, basically the raw materials. Um, we are using the highest quality of raw materials that you can, uh, yet you can find for these kind of products. And uh, basically everything is what we call all natural. Uh, that means there's no preservatives, no artificial aromas or colorings uh, added to the products. And basically all the recipes are the old recipes. The production of Danish butter cookies starts with the vast amount of ingredients being inspected. Each delivery has to be certified and released before they can be moved into the mixing rooms. Approximately 60 tons of flour, 30 tons of sugar, 25 tons of butter and 2,400 litres of eggs are used every day. 
depending on the type of cookies being made, the ingredients are mixed using these continuous mixers. When mixed, the dough is sent along conveyor belts to buffer tanks that check the consistency and integrity of the dough. It then makes its way down to the moulding level. Here there are multiple types of moulding machines that create the various types of cookies. The dough is fed through a rotary moulding machine, which cuts out the desired cookie shape from the dough and then onto a conveyor belt, where it is given a sugar coating before being sent for baking. We are selling more than 40 million tins every year. We are exporting those products to more than 80 countries throughout the world, and we have been able to, to build a very strong businesses on our brands, Kelsons and Royal Dance. Uh, in, in many parts of the world, but especially in North America and Asia. Next are the multiple extrusion lines, where the dough is fed into the top and extruded onto the belts in its automated pre-designed pattern. Each line is closely monitored and checked, with bakers regularly taking samples to check its weight and consistency. A sugar coating is added from the 30 plus tons of sugar the factory uses per day, and then it is on to the ovens. Depending on the cookie type, the baking process is between seven and nine minutes. During that time, the cookie is exposed to multiple temperatures to give it the desired shape, color, and crunch. Upon leaving the oven, the cookies are cooled and sent to the stacking machines. The cookies are stacked into paper cups, three per cup. Using a vacuum picker that sucks the cookies up from the line, multiple sacking lines cater for the various types of cookies that are being produced. They are then inspected for defects, breaks or misplacement. After inspection, they move on to assortment, where they are split into lanes to fill each tin. The cookies are moved onto five different lanes, where gradually they will be sorted into the various different types of cookies. First, however, they have to make it through multiple inspections, where the slightest imperfection will mean all those cookies will be ejected. Every cookie goes through a metal detector to make sure there are no traces of metal. Every hour this machine is tested by a worker, using different metal samples to test its sensitivity. On each line there are keen-eyed bakers doing manual inspections, as well as multiple air guns that will reject cookies upon detecting an imperfect weight balance. A typical Danish butter cookie product consists of five different cookies, and the cookie of each of the characteristic of each of the product varies uh, with different tastes, but what is in common is the good butter taste, sweet taste, and then some specific taste like vanilla or coconut or nut taste as well. The assortments are gathered and transferred by a vacuum machine into the tins, four tins at a time, layer by layer, over five different lines. This produces 130 tins a minute and 896,000 tins per week. A further line inspection then takes place where they are weighed. Any tins short of the weight are rejected. Once approved, a top layer of paper is added. Then the lids are securely fitted and sealed with tamper-proof tape. Machines then pack the tins into either gift boxes or directly into large cases so they can be sent to the warehouse for distribution. Every hour, a final check is carried out by quality control. Finished boxes are opened and the tins are checked. Any missing cookies, labels, faulty packaging or batch codes are documented so that the line can be fully inspected and corrected. Finally, the cookies are sent for stacking, where three robots transfer up to 120 boxes per pallet to the warehouse. They are sealed, loaded into trucks and distributed across the world. Cookies and biscuits, truly a wickedly delicious invention. Nothing can beat a day on the beach soaking up the sun. We all know that without adequate protection, our skin can quickly burn under those sunny skies. But what you probably don't know is that there is a connection between World War II and the quest to keep our skin healthy under the scorching summer sun. The problem with sunlight is not the golden rays we can see, but rather the ultraviolet light, also known as UV, that we can't. We're familiar with the light that we can see, and that sits in the famous spectrum going from red to violet. But outside that spectrum, there are other kinds of light. At the low end, beyond the red, there's the infrared light that you might have from a room heater and the radio waves that you tune into with a radio or a television. 
At the other end, the very high energy end, there's ultraviolet light and x-rays. We need protection from ultraviolet light because the particles of light, the photons, carry more energy the further into the blue direction they go, and ultraviolet light is beyond the visible range. As these high energy particles hit the body, they deposit energy into it, and they deposit enough energy that they can cause skin cancer. So why can UV light potentially cause us so much harm? So UV light is broken down into different types of UV. Most of our sunlight is UVA, and that penetrates deep into our skin and actually gives part of the ageing process. Then we have UVB, which is something that's involved with non-melanotic um, skin cancers. UV light can lead to damage of the DNA, so the genetic component to our cells. And if your skin's um, exposed to the sunlight, this can be damage to the DNA, which can in turn can cause problems with skin cancer. While skin cancer can wreak havoc on a cellular level, the painful effects of sunburn have been more noticeable, with humans suffering for thousands of years. While our atmosphere offers some protection, UV rays can still cause us harm. Sunburn is an acute toxic reaction to the sun's UV rays, and the only protection in years gone by was to keep your clothes on or apply a protective substance to your skin, such as olive oil, as used by the ancient Greeks. And that was until the creation of synthetic sunscreens in the 1930s. Ultraviolet protection basically works by depositing a substance on the skin that either reflects the ultraviolet radiation away again or absorbs it. The sun creams use some reflective properties, but they're mainly used to filter out the UV light and therefore they reduce the exposure to the lower surfaces of the skin to the damaging UV rays. And this is where the military link with UV protection comes in. While pioneering work in developing sunscreens had begun in the 1930s, during World War II, an American pharmacist called Benjamin Green developed a sticky dark sunscreen to help protect American soldiers from the tropical sun in the Pacific theater. Called Red Veterinary Petrolatum, or Red Vet Pet for short, this thick, sticky substance worked as a physical blocking layer against harmful UV rays, but was impractical as it was cumbersome to apply and stained clothing. Today, sunscreen manufacturers use a mix of organic or inorganic substances to either absorb, scatter or reflect the harmful UV rays. Titanium dioxide and zinc oxide are two materials commonly used to physically block the rays and would lead to early sunblock creams having a distinctive white appearance as the block could not be rubbed into the skin. Today, better manufacturing processes allow these materials to appear invisible to the naked eye and other UVB absorbing organic chemicals are added that convert the sun's incoming energy into waste heat. From World War II to the beaches of today, Using sunscreen means you can enjoy the sun safely. Now that is truly a wicked invention. Our intrepid tester has been told about the importance of protecting himself from the sun's harmful UV rays, but he only believes what he can see with his own eyes, and as we humans can't see UV rays, doesn't believe that they are dangerous or that creams and clothes protect you. Silly man. Let's show him how effective they are the materials, UV active beads and a piece of UV clothing, plastic bags, various sun creams, a UV light. The experiment. As our tester can see, the UV active beads are white. If they're exposed to UV light from the sun, simulated here by our handy UV light, they can change colour as they contain pigment that reacts to the ultraviolet light. So, let's test the effectiveness of the sun cream we use and the clothing we wear against the harmful UV rays from the sun. To begin, the sun creams. Our tester fills three plastic bags with UV active beads. Number one is left unprotected. For bag number two, he applies a thin layer of sun cream with an SPF or sun protection factor of 10. For the final bag, a sun cream with an SPF of 50 is applied. The UV light is scientifically held just above our samples and switched on. The bags containing the beads are now exposed to the UV light. Our tester is astounded to discover that the beads have reacted depending on the SPF of the sun cream. 
with the 50 SPF beads paler than its 10 SPF coated neighbour, proving that it offers the most protection against the sun's rays. And what about the UV protection clothing? The experiment is repeated, with the first bag left unprotected, and a piece of UV protective clothing draped over the bag number 2. And the UV light is switched on. Again, like the sun cream, the UV protective clothing's beads are paler, demonstrating less UV light is getting through. So Mr Tester, who's silly now? You might not be able to see the danger yourself, but your skin still needs protecting in the hot sun. There, that told him, stubborn man. It is synonymous with sailing the high seas, conjuring up images of a sailor's cramped living quarters, a seaman trying to find a bit of comfort whilst away on long voyages. Strong from any available beam, it is of course the hammock. But these ingenious beds actually originated on dry land. Many anthropologists believe that hammocks date back about a thousand years uh, to Central America, where they were used by the Maya and other indigenous people as a way to sleep, protected from anything that might get you from the ground, so creepy crawlies, snakes and other dangerous animals. And it was a really easy, natural way to construct something to sleep in uh, that was also safe. And there's also evidence that people used to light little fires underneath the hammocks to keep them toasty warm while they were sleeping and also to help to ward off insects and other animals. While there are many variations on a hammock's design, the common features are a piece of material that is strung between two supports to keep the user off the ground. We often think of a hammock as being made from canvas or cotton, but the Mayans probably used a variety of other materials including weave tree bark to create them. Visiting European explorers were quick to recognise the hammock's usefulness. It's thought that Christopher Columbus and his men were the ones who uh, discovered the, this idea of a hammock in America and they brought it back to Europe. And as new materials were discovered, like cotton, canvas and so on, then uh, hammocks were able to be constructed not just in America but also in Europe as well. Europeans may have started to recognise the usefulness of this ingenious, lightweight, portable bed, but the military, in the guise of the emerging power of Britain and its fledgling Royal Navy, started to embrace the qualities that made the hammock the ideal solution for sailors sleeping under sail. Hammocks were first adopted by the Royal Navy at the end of the Tudor times, uh, 1597, and it makes sense when you think about it. We were starting to explore the world more and more. Ships on the high seas, if you're sleeping on the deck, the ship's going to be rolling, so that hammock was more comfortable and you could get more men bedded down in a smaller space with the hammocks hanging from the beams and we're still using them in the Royal Navy to this day. The space-saving qualities of the hammock literally meant you could cram in more men into a compact space and also double up the use of the parts of the ship which created a more efficient design. For example, by the early 19th century, when the Royal Navy was a major power on the high seas, huge ships known as Man of War were stuffed to the gills with cannons arrayed over two or three decks. To save space, the men would sleep on these gun decks, their hammocks strung across the ceiling. In addition to space saving, the hammock also offered increased safety to sailors. It was free to swing from side to side in heavy swells, offering stability to the sleeping men, and with high sides cocooning and preventing them falling dangerously out of their bunks onto the floor below. In addition to the military, the hammock has also cemented itself into civilian life as well. Conjuring up images of lazy days in the garden or exotic escapes with a hammock strung up between two palm trees on some deserted white sandy beach. There might actually be some science behind our love of these tropical themed beds. It's actually been proven, it was proven in 2011 uh, in a Swiss study that sleeping in a hammock mimics this movement that does something to synchronize uh, brain waves and it means that you fall into a much deeper sleep much quicker and so you get a really good sleep uh, from being in a hammock and that also ties in with the idea of us rocking babies to sleep and why that's an efficient way of people going to sleep. A tool for sleeping, popularized by the military, the hammock is truly a wicked invention. Established in 1996, the handmade hammocks from Ticket to the Moon are based and manufactured in Bali, Indonesia, where up to 400 units are made each day. Um, yeah, the fabric makes it really unique because um, it's really light, elastic, so we can have a um, very compact product and um, 
Also the fact that we are manufacturer, it allows our user to customize the, the ammo gear. The process starts with a one and a half meter roll of parachute material. It is precisely measured and then cut using a bandsaw. The rolls are then unwound by hand and checked for any flaws or holes. Workers then cut and tear the fabric into strips to make the central line of the hammock's body. Smaller pieces of fabric are then taken to workers with hand cutters to make the hammock pouch and the carry case, which we will see later. The main body of the hammock is then sewn together with its two outer borders. They are merged and the very ends of the fabric folded and stitched together to seal and make the joint strong to prevent tearing. The three yarns of fabric have to be sewn collectively. If there is one mistake, the worker would have to start the whole process again from new material. Now, both ends of the hammock are turned up and sewn together to make a tube, so that it is ready for the nautical rope to be inserted, which makes the hammock suspendable. The main advantage of the hammock is to get comfortable everywhere. So you travel like you can set up your hammock within a minute. And uh, also to protect you from the dirt, the insect that can be on the ground. The pouches that we saw being made earlier are now being further stitched. The labels are added as well as the logo embroidered zip for the moon shaped carry case. The ticket to the moon logo is stitched into place and is attached to the hammock's body, together with the pouches and pockets. Into the final stages of production, and only the most experienced workers use a bar tack machine to attach the pouch to the hammock. A bar tack stitch is a tight zigzag that is repeated back and forth over itself to reinforce and lock all the edges of the material using a very strong line of stitching to give it extra strength and durability. The special nylon parachute material used to make these hammocks is especially strong and tough so it can cope with the most challenging of environments. It has zero pressure points throughout, making the hammock extremely comfortable as it effectively moulds around the user's body. The hammock comes in a variety of different shapes and sizes, and all are anti-mildew to prevent mould and bacteria that could prevail in dry and wet climates. The material is also 100% skin friendly, and because it is so light and flexible, it can be folded and packed away using a minimal amount of space. The finished product has to be inspected, and quality control assesses all the finished hammocks, double checking the fabric and all of the sewing. Any loose yarn is removed, and any faults found in the fabric will see that product being recycled. The final stages see the nautical rope and suspending hooks fitted and attached before it is packed into its new handmade carry case, boxed and sent out, ready to spend its days swinging under the sun and the stars. The hammock, truly a wicked invention. So there you have it, a dash through the hidden history, super science and amazing manufacture of products that you use every day, but have never realized their amazing background. Biscuits, sunscreen, and hammocks, all wicked inventions.